Hello everyone, Mark from Schmidt Music here. On an exciting day, we've got some big news for you. Um, it's, oh, it's about 12 degrees outside right now. <laughs> Nachito calls it uh, Minnesota. Um, being from Cuba, I think he knows the difference. So um, anyhow, we are welcomed here today by Aurora and Nachito Herrera into their home um, to make kind of a nice announcement here. Um, Nachito has just been announced as being an official Steinway artist, which is a big deal. It's actually very cool. Yes, it is indeed. I went and looked up um, what it means to be a Steinway artist as far as a definition. There's around 1,800 pianists worldwide that are official Steinway artists, which means they have chosen to perform on Steinway pianos exclusively, and each owns a Steinway. None are paid to do so, which is incredible. Steinway artists come from different genres, classical, jazz, pop, and rock. And amazingly, Nachito Herrera, newly announced Steinway artist, plays all of those things. So Nachito, what does it mean to you to be a Steinway artist? Well, uh, my dear friend, first of all, I want to say that thanks so much to you and to definitely uh, the Brianna, Matt, and the whole people are always welcome here to my house uh, and, and become an Steinway artist is, I want to say, it is a dream come through because actually um, um, I start to my piano career with the Steinway. My grandfather bought a brand new Steinway for my father long, long, long time ago on the like the 1950s in my country, Cuba. And that was a piano, which is a picture around the living room. You can check later that it is myself practicing on Steinway. It seems that I have been following a lot of different, uh, fantastic, wonderful, great, it's time with artists like Sergei Rachmaninoff, like Arthur Rubenstein on the jazz piano language, to say it in some way, McCoy Tainer, which was one of my, uh, uh, you know, favorite piano players, uh, Ramsey Lewis. And so it is, I want to say it is definitely one of the biggest challenge and commitments I have been having in my professional life. It is not just a way to get the endorsement, this uh, exclusive endorsement with this beautiful uh, piano company is what you are supposed to do to keep that, to maintain that in your career, which is a big challenge. It is a big commitment because uh, it is a lot of, lot of definitely a great piano players in this family. So for, like for me, it is definitely like I said before, it is a dream come through. It is it is something I have been thinking and dreaming on, on, on get it. And I was definitely beyond excited when I get this uh, nomination and, and, and get this, uh, you know, wonderful news to become part of the It's Time With Family. Uh, everybody knows like, uh, the Steinway piano sir, is one of the most, or, or kind of like the best instrument ever. You can have it. Um, you can do anything you want in there. It is a wonderful instrument. You can go from one classical sound to jazz to, to anything you want to do. So like for me, it is definitely an honor. Sometimes we think like, uh, um, I don't know if we deserve it or not, but here we are celebrating something, some of the good news, even when we are around this very unfortunate uh, nightmare dealing with this kind of pandemic, but uh, uh, dealing with this, uh, but at the same time celebrating the life and celebrating the music with the beautiful instruments like this, uh, this time with D in my house. Thank you. Okay, well, I like the first piece I want to play I decide to call with a Cuban feeling in Spanish is called consentimiento cubano. And it is based of uh, what I have been trying to prove for almost all my professional career, which is music is one, it's music. It, it, it is a always great connection in between classical and uh, Cuban and jazz and Latin jazz. And I always say like classical music is the queen, it's the mother of the music, which is a lot of things we can find in there. This specific piece, uh, it is based on the segment of my favorite
classical piano concerto ever, or is a Rachmaninoff second piano concerto C minor, and it is a it is a, a, a segment or a part which uh, the piano play a melody which uh, I am going to play it before uh, I play the real tune and you will kind of have an idea about how the sound is like the way it was written on classically and then you will be able to listen the same melody but using more kind of this kind of like it, uh, let's call Cuban syncopation stuff but known a single note it changed in between the two ways to do it here we go
amazing. And I was peeking out the window and I noticed the snow started to melt. <laughs> we need to keep that going. Well, please, in the end, let's do that. So I think it in terms of melt the snow quicker, you and I should play together. Oh, no, I'm letting this, this is your show. <laughs> your piano. Hey, um, I noticed you've got a lot of awards and stuff in, in the yeah. room here. And I'm just going to read a quote that says, yeah. Nacio Nachito Herrera, hot classic Cuban piano Latin jazz, stunned Cuban audiences at the age of 12 performing Rachmaninoff's Concerto No. 2 with the Havana Symphony Orchestra. That must have been incredible. So if you could just give us a little, well, uh, how you got here. I mean, you were in Cuba. How did you end up in the Twin Cities? <laughs> Let us know that. That is a good question, my dear friend. Well, uh, uh, after I get my PhD, at the Superior Institute of Art in Havana, Cuba, in piano and in orchestra conductor. I always have this kind of like a, a, a dream to try to combine these all different music styles, like classical and jazz and Cuba, and, and Cuba, like it, I said before. And in 1996, exactly, I get a, a phone call from Jesus Alemany, which was a uh, director of uh, a band called Cubanismo. And uh, a few months later, he talked to me, he needed a musical director of, uh, like for the band, because he was always playing in the front, so he needed somebody in the back to take care of the whole orchestra. It was about 30 people on the stage. And um, believe it or not, uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, Ogway, Center for, for Performing Arts was the first venue I performed in the United States. I flew from Havana to Miami, just so that kind of like a, I changed the plane, and then and, uh, we came here to St. Paul. So, um, and I get in love with the city and uh, with the people. And then in 2001, just giving you a quick history, but in 2001, I get the invitation to come to be the conductor of the orchestra and the musical uh, director and arranger of uh, the play at the History Theater in Sao Paulo. Tribute to the kind of like the first uh, musical Mexican family decided to move and establish themselves in Minnesota. So that was when I came in 2001. Right after that, uh, I actually did a few master classes at McPhail Center for Music during that time, during the play. Um, and then uh, was a kind of, uh, I don't know how to say, it was a kind of like a bittersweet, happy and sad time when I was supposed to return back to Cuba right. to get back to Cubanismo to start the biggest tour, three uh, let's say, famous orchestras in that time, Buena Vista Social Club, Afro-Cuban All-Stars, and Cubanismo, we were going to do the first two together. Unfortunately, uh, visa problem, immigration problem, as you know, has been always a big delay man, in between Cuba and the United States. Uh, things have, they start to know to work very well, and and then I got a proposal to stay in Minnesota working, and here we are. They're thinking like at the beginning in 2001, I was supposed to come just for like a few months, prepare the music of the play, conduct, work, do some math classes at my fail, I'll return back to my country. And uh, this year, we hopefully uh, next month, my daughter, Midalis, is the one keep always in the, whole, the dates and everything. If, in track and so she said that February 7th we will be celebrating if the this oops we got a little spider around we will be celebrating 20 years of myself wow. in Minnesota yeah so well uh, we're happy to have you <laughs> we're very lucky I really love Minnesota there's nothing bad I can talk about it it is a wonderful people the hospitality uh, um, even, even, you won't believe, but uh, even when I am touring and, uh, and lots of friends ask me about 
where do I am living now? And I said, well, I live in Minnesota, but do you live in Minneapolis? No, I am, I live in White Bear, but I, I played in Minneapolis and a lot. And it is very musical city and very musical state. And I said, never take Minnesota as a kind of like a joke when you go there and place, because it is very musical. Yeah. Is that the people know music in Minnesota? They know jazz. They know all the styles. They know classical, and we are definitely lucky, in my own opinion, and actually having the the the, the blessed to perform with them a, a few times already. Uh, I think we have one of the best classical uh, uh, symphony orchestras in the world. Yeah. I think in Minnesota orchestra. It is one of the best, and I do remember the first time I, I, I got an invitation to perform with the Minnesota Orchestra conducting by the one and only Doc Sevens, and, <laughs> and we did the one, that, that great show there, and, and uh, well, the sound was fantastic. And I do remember when I get inside to the orchestra hall for the first time, I thought that was a recording. I said, well, when the orchestra is going to come, and then my stage manager said, no, that's, that's the orchestra getting ready for you. And I said, wow, you know, it is, it, it is, it is a fabulous orchestra. I hope, you know, we can back to play together, but that's, that's, you know, uh, uh, briefly how I ended up here in Minnesota and, uh, living in this house for almost 18 years already. Wow. And, uh, I love it. One of the things that I love, my, my wife loved the most in Minnesota is the, the seasons, which we can leave the, the whole four seasons in here, which, you know, in Cuba, pretty much is summer all the time. We got winter. <laughs> really, we don't want to say we have winter in right. Cuba because in January, yeah, you get probably in the 40s, in a kind of late evening, sometimes few days, but right in the morning you go back to the 70s. And so let's not to call that as a winter, but here she really love it. Uh, uh, we, you know, have been here, like I said, for almost 18 years, and, 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 and she's very fond of snow, and, and, and so okay. it, it looks like uh, we picked up the right place, and, and I'm playing with many musicians for many years, I just want to tell to the world like that we, we, we have a wonderful stage here, that a wonderful level of professional musicians and the music education in Minnesota is one of the top in the whole country. It is unbelievable. Yeah. So, you know, it is a lot. It is a lot. And, 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 and I'm happy to be able to make the decision to stay in Minnesota because always, you know, musicians always ask you the same question when it's in terms of music. Why not to move to the big cities as a music? San Francisco or Los Angeles or Miami or New York. Well, for some reason, God put me in Minnesota. We like it. We and, really like it. <laughs> and We're glad if you're here. people don't mind, I really would like to stay here. <laughs> Well, I'd love to have you play something again and give the Steinway another workout if you've got something for us. Yes. All right. Definitely. The next piece I want to play, it is continue with this program, um, trying to prove like a music is just one. It's music. And uh, it is part of my uh, uh, solo piano album, which hopefully after we are done with this situation, the pandemic, we are going to be doing a big release. Uh, it's called From Back to Havana. So it is combining uh, the classical music, trying to incorporate in, in, into some Cuban styles. This is taken out of uh, Chopin Prelude E minor, which a lot of people know it is one of the most well-known uh, Chopin Preludes. Uh, and, and this time I use uh, a Cuban rhythm, it's called Danzon, D-A-N-Z-O-N. Danzon is actually our national Cuban rhythm in Cuba. So they, they, you will be able to listen the melody and then on the left hand is always incorporating some of the kind of like Cuban flavor, like we call like Cuban espresso coffee flavor in uh -huh. the left hand. And uh, we take it from there. And I decide to call this Chopaneando. All right. Looking forward.
thank you, Nachito, again. My very, pleasure. Man. Very proud to be here um, representing Schmidt Music and Steinway and an incredible artist, Nachito Herrera. Thank you. I do have a question. Um, yes. This was actually, uh, this is another quote. It was, uh, recovering from a significant hospital and ICU stay with COVID-19, yeah. well-known musician Nachito Herrera celebrated his recovery by improvising this beautiful song called Esperanza, which means, I believe, hope. It is. So give us your take on that. <laughs> Well, uh, quite quick, well, I'm going to try to be just quick in this. Uh, um, back in March 28th, uh, right, just uh, if you remember, unfortunately, just uh, uh, just a few days after you and, and, and Doc and another and Marlene and, and all friends who were, and Greg, they, you brought this beautiful yep. piano to my house so at the beginning of March or so. You know, so that I didn't have enough time to enjoy it, to to practice and have it in my house. And on March 28th was when I started to feel completely disorientated in my house. And as you can see, my house is not huge, so it is kind of easy to remember going from living room to bathroom and to the different rooms. So I was completely disorientated. And I didn't even know how to go from my living room to the bathroom. Wow. My wife, Aurora, started to realize like that I was definitely not in a good shape, and and uh, she called my daughter Medalis and my son David, but uh, my son David lived a little bit far from here, in the city in Wisconsin, so it took for him longer to come here. So um, they brought me, my daughter and my wife brought me to the St. John Hospital, and a couple of wonderful doctors there. Uh, admit me there and uh, according to what they said because I have to be honest with you I can't remember anything I wow. can't even remember uh, when they put me in my car to bring me to the hospital so they get so nervous that they didn't even call 911 they tried to do it as a Cuban way they just said well let's try to put him in the car and bring him to St. John because St. John in Maplewood is just about 10 minutes from where I live and according to the doctor that met me there, he said, like it, I was just a 35% of oxygen in my lungs. Oh. So I can't remember anything. I can't even remember when I get into the hospital, nothing, my friend. Um, right after that, they said, like it, they, did, they didn't um, have the, the whole entire equipment to take care of me there because um, I was really in a bad condition. Actually, when the doctor came out of the hospital to talk to my wife, she was waiting on the car. Uh, they gave her the very bad news, like that uh, they gave me approximately three hours life. Wow. If they didn't stabilize myself enough to move me from Maplewood to Minneapolis, that was all I was going to have. Three wow. hours of life, <clears throat> and then uh, they explain her exactly what they were going to try to do. They contact Dr. Melissa Granswell. Now has become one of my best friends, and Melissa Granswell is the director of the ECMO program in Minnesota. Minnesota have to feel, have to definitely feel lucky. We are just one of the few states we have the ECMO machine, which is kind of like a cleaning the blood on your lungs and then working in that way very i want to say very nice coincidence when when i went through the whole process uh, uh she was just three days back from cuba be before they admit me at the university of minnesota hospital and uh all I am telling you right now, my friend, is, is something people have been telling me, the doctors, the nurses, my wife, my family. I, I can't remember anything until April 11th. Um, I was in coma for 14 days. Wow. Uh, completely intubated with the ECMO connecting for uh, 12 days. Um, actually, I need to get a bypass in my heart because the uh, by the time Melissa was working to connect me to ECMO, my heart started to failure. So that, that was a, they said like it was a really difficult time in between those two weeks. 
on April 11th, I wake up. I just open my eyes because uh, it looks like it was a God put in my one of my eight grand uh, kids, uh, uh, Liam, which is one of my dollies, is uh, th- uh, uh, the responsibility to wake me up because uh, he screamed on me on April 11th and he said, the, the Papi, they, they don't call me grandpa. They said, Papi, because I said, if you call me grandpa, you will never even <laughs> get a birthday gift, never. So Papi. they call me Papi and they call me my, to my wife. So they said, uh, Papi, you had to wake up, but he is screaming on through the iPad, like the way enough for me to hear and wake up. So wow. I opened my eyes and was, honestly, I swear in front of God, my friend, was the very first time I saw myself connected to a lot of cables, tubes, and, and, and not even able to speak because I is still intubated. So I honestly, I thought it was a joke. I said, no, 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 because you know, my brain would just remember when I was here with you guys practicing with my beautiful piano, which we all baptized as a Sandito, and then getting ready to even perform Prachmaninov second piano concerto with the Waisera Simpson. So that's what I kept in, in my brain. So for me, it was a kind of like a joke to be there completely not able to move seeing like it, I was connecting to cables and, and, and uh, tubes and everywhere. And then uh, the next day on the on the 12th, uh, uh, when the doctor started to come, they take me all tubes and everything out of my body and they start to explain me what happened. Wow. So they say like it, I got one of the most aggressive one. And because it was back in March, was pretty much new things. So they have to, uh, it start to make different kind of uh, hard decisions on the very last minute to what kind of medicaments were they were able to use in my body. Thanks God, on April 12, uh, I asked Aurora, my wife, to contact Lowell and, 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 and to see if it was a possibility to bring a keyboard to my room. I want to play, I want to get out of my bed. And I have to be honest with you, that was the most scary time ever in my life because for a person never has been hospitalized before. For a person actually three weeks before the situation happened, I was here enjoying my piano. I'm practicing Rachmaninoff piano a concerto, which as you know, not because I played and not because it's my favorite piano concerto. Everybody say the same thing. It is one of the most complicated piano concertos you can play in your career and it is very difficult piece to work with and I was just enjoying to have this beautiful D9 Steinway in my house for the first time and, I, and I'm, I'm playing. I, I, I want to check in, in, in how bad condition I was. So finally Greg Eichhorn, the sound engineer of the Dakota, he take the challenge to probably not even been able to get his keyboard back because they had to sanitize and everything. And they told to him, well, we don't know if you're gonna be able to get it back. He brought a, a, a keyboard and they bringing it to my room. And when they were able to move me in this kind of like electric tower, I don't know how they say you look like a container, put it in the, <laughs> in the boat, I don't know. And it is the first time for me to be conscious and seeing like they move me that way and they put me on the chair and I couldn't even play the C major the scale. C major. I couldn't even do it. Wow. I, I'm a, I have no control, I have no uh, synchronization in my finger, I have nothing. I said, well, that was exactly the time when I realized, like, wow, this is bad. Something very bad has been happening, and 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 uh, I just pray. Um, um, I do believe in God. I just pray to say, "Well, God, you know, this is one of the most important thing in my life. I cannot live without playing my piano." So uh, it's when they even say like miracles start to happen yeah. because uh, uh, the same day in the afternoon, the first physical therapist came to my room. Then you start to work in them to teach, back to teach me even how to walk. I didn't know how to walk. I didn't know how to eat. I didn't know how to even drink water, nothing. So they start to work this kind of intense program, which uh, 
In the afternoon of the day 12, so 24 hours later, after I wake up, I was able to walk by myself. They said, no, this cannot be happening because he has been for almost 15 days on bed without moving. So I, for the first half an hour, I use a walker and then I don't want to use a walker anymore. And then I use a cane for a little bit. And then at the end of the day, I was just kind of walking around my room and seeing, and I do remember it was a very snowy day. And I have a, this nice room, a huge room, and it was a big glass window, which uh, uh, obviously I get tired walking. And I saw like it really far and I wasn't, but uh, you know, you, you, you're you tired and you you work intense to try to make things happen. And I would just, I told to a really young guy, a really nice guy was my physical therapist. And I said, can I please stay here? Because even see the snow was something completely weird for me. And then on the 15th in the afternoon uh, was when the second test be like back negative, you know. Uh, it is part of the policy in Minnesota, at a, at a, um, I don't know in other states or another hospital, but you need to pass a three negative tests in terms to get discharged. So on the 14th, they did the first one in back right away, negative. Obviously, uh, we all cry, we, we, we were all celebrating there. And then on the 15th, I am seeing the, the nurse came and I said, well, your, your doctor asked for the second test because uh, we want to keep working on that. And so it was a very long day for me because they went deeper and they wanted definitely check everything. And then uh, that was a really long day because uh, the results came back around 3.30, 4 in the afternoon. So I have been waiting this very big nightmare, always asking everybody every half an hour, do we know something about the results? Nobody knew anything until I saw everybody jumping and, and I'm celebrating like body outside of my room. <laughs> that was really, it said, so I was, I remember I was eating, so I was already sitting in the little table and the chair and I was eating something and then I am looking through the window the, through the glass and I'm seeing everybody jumping and everybody just uh, and then nobody realized like uh, hey look at me I am the person I need to know what in the world is happening outside and then uh, the nurse that uh, um, I do remember her name very clear Jenny really wonderful person Jenny uh, he, uh, she talked to me through the leader, the speaker, which, uh, you know, English is my second language, so that sometimes can, so that leader, the speaker, which you can't understand very well, but uh, I don't know, God put me exactly the way where I was able to understand everything, and, and she said, oh, I'm sorry, do you know what's happening now? I said, no, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about why your test came back negative. Uh. That was... The time I couldn't definitely hold my cry, a lot of tears came out of my eye, and 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 and, and I said, you know, thanks God, thanks to all of you. And then when the let's say the chief of the team came, and he asked me about uh, what I would like to do, and I told him, you know, you work hard to save my life. You want to hold people. I think it is room and this bed. I think it's somebody outside. This is better than me because that they are dealing for the life. They are dealing to to being able to back to the family. So if you don't mind, please, I want to get the church and I want to go back to my house. During these four days of recovering, uh, this tune came to my head because I said, well. You need to prepare yourself psychologically because it don't matter what you want to leave, you want to back to your family. I said, well, God, if at least I can play something, it would be great because the music has been, you know, has been one of the strongest and the most important part of my recovery in all my therapy, you know. 
And once when this tune just came to my head, I started to play some notes and things like that. And then I was able to complete. It is not complicated. It is all about soul. It is all about feeling. Because remember, I wasn't able to play one major scale all the way through. So I couldn't like technically to do anything. So I, it is when music start to help you to heal. So I told him, and I prayed, I said, God, if I, at least I can play the melody, something is going to help me a lot. Besides, obviously, to have the spiritual support of all friends, including you, Doug, Marlene, all people from Smith Music, which it is, you know, now we have been having a wonderful relationship for so many years, but now it is getting even more solid because uh, um, I am so glad and excited that uh, uh, you uh, were one of the most important key in get the whole entire process of Steinway uh, uh, exclusive endorsement, uh, endorsement done. And, um, and now we are working together and Smith Music is, I am so happy, you know, you guys decided to take a challenge. I didn't say anything. <laughs> You decided to take the challenge to be one of my principal, or my principal, sponsored in Minnesota and hopefully all around the world. So that it is definitely, you know, the bliss to, to, to have friends like you and an and old crew from Smith Music. And, you know, now you have a, a key one friend in your list, which it is... This is not done. We just get done with one step, which is get this uh, wonderful news, the exclusive endorsement with the Starwood family. But now we have a long journey to work together. Yep, agreed. And, uh, Very much. And uh, let the people know how important and how wonderful job Smith Music has been doing for decades, for generation to generation in the music education in Minnesota. And now you got me as a, I don't know, I want to be definitely the principal sponsor of the Smith <laughs> Music everywhere. So the here is, a, I want to play a couple tunes. I want to play Esperanza, definitely. And then uh, I want to play one more tune, probably like a mat, so like a, as an anchor. It is called uh, From Back to Havana. It is the piece it is given title to that uh, uh, the first solo piano record I I made before I get sick. So hopefully we 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 can definitely have a big party and and have that release soon whenever this whole situation with the pandemic is done. But here it is the tune I composed at the ICU room at the hospital of Minnesota wow. when I wake up. Uh, and I decide to call like that hope, esperanza.
Okay, this piece is called From Back to Havana. Why? Because it's actually the piece is given a title to my first it's a, a solo piano album. Like I said before, hopefully, you know, with all my friends of Smith Music, as my sponsor and uh, all of my friends, we can do the CD release soon after I know, and it's no doubt. We all together, fighting together and working together, we are going to go through this uh, very uh, bad nightmare we have been going through with this pandemic and hopefully soon we are going to be celebrating the life. So this is um, a piece is, is Bach Prelude C minor. For people don't know about this piece, it is this one. <laughs> is going all the way like that from beginning through the end and the back it is one of the most important composers we actually studied and worked with when we even talk about jazz because the whole revolution saying it in some way he did in terms of a harmony and, and, and many things so that prelude uh, um, I decided to uh, find a way I was able to incorporate some kind of a Cuban feeling on my left hand, which uh, um, unfortunately you won't listen the original left hand like it because uh, my left hand now is it is going to be working in terms to incorporate that kind of Cuban coffee flavor into the prelude. But what you are going to listen, and hopefully from the end, like from beginning through the end, let's say that this this pray to see if it's going okay all the way through. It is actually the real prelude. So the right hand is keeping the real Johann Sebastian Bar prelude. Left hand, it is incorporating that Cuban espresso with the black beans and the white rice. Like it. It's just kind of working with that kind of syncopation. I know a lot of people like that. I know my dear friend Mark Mueller like to do that a lot too. So, here is Bach Prelude C minor in Latin jazz. And uh, thank you so much to all of you for coming to my house, which is your house. And I hope to definitely to see you soon. God bless you all.